Good morning, buddy. How are you? What time? What time did you get out of there? Uh, ooh, uh like one thirty, maybe. Wow. Okay. Yeah, but it was worth it. You want to know why? Yes. The Rangers are going to the ALCS. <laughs> <laughs> Man, there's a great shot that someone took of you that Peyton tweeted as the show tease. I'm retweeting it right now. This is better than your TV shot. I mean, were you a fan? Uh, separate journalist from fan last night as you were probably going insane. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's both. I'm, I'm, I hope it came off, you know, in the stuff we did on air. It was broadcaster, right? You know, yeah. I... I obviously elated uh but like inside you know when they got the final out you know so emily jones and i wait in in the tunnel right off well. the side of the field and because we go and we'll do an interview or two on the field before we go into the clubhouse and i mean the fan in me wants to storm the field and run to the mound and jump up and down with the guys but you know i gotta can't do that uh but yeah i mean it's inside the the fan doesn't you know, doesn't leave, but uh, hopefully it doesn't uh, intrude too much on air. But it, that, it's just those moments are special, right? I, I, I tweeted this at some ungodly hour. Uh, it, it this is not the final desired destination for the team, but I mean, what a ride so far, and and just enjoying it. I think when you miss the playoffs six years in a row, uh, you don't get so focused on, you know, oh, we got more work to do. They do. I mean, I'm not playing, so it doesn't really matter to me. I, I just, I'm going to show up. But uh, it's, th this ride has been so much fun, and it's really cool to, uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be able to get an up-close look at these experiences. It's, uh, it, it's pretty incredible. Best atmosphere that you've heard at that stadium so far in all your games? Not even close. Not, not, Eric and I were talking, Matt and I were talking, so I wasn't, I wasn't at any of the games in 2010. I did go to game five of the 2011 World Series, uh, and I was actually someone's driver for game four, so I was outside. Yeah, thank you for that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 you wish. Uh, and game, I, I mean, I, I, game five was loud in 2011 when Mike Napoli had the, the go-ahead in the eighth. It, you know, it obviously was loud at. Eric said that he hasn't heard that place louder since Neftali Feliz struck out A-Rod game six, 2010 of the ALCS. Wow. Um, yeah, I, it wasn't – yeah, when, when, when Seager at the home run, you got a sense of what it could be. And then when Adolis hit his home run, that place erupted. Uh, and I, I thought one of the coolest moments, a moment I hope I, I don't ever forget, is the curtain call for Nathan Avaldi. Mm -hmm. Because, first of all, it was so deserved. Uh Second of all, one of my biggest – it's not an issue. I, I don't know. I, I, it always bugs me that when a pitcher has such a great outing but completes an inning, they usually don't get the recognition yeah. because they walk off the field with the team and people are more – yeah, they're cheering the pitcher, but they're cheering the accomplishment of getting three outs of that inning. Whereas, you know, when Derek Holland – uh, was pulled after, what, eight and a third in game four and arguably the greatest pitching performance uh, in a postseason game in Rangers history, he got a thunderous ovation as he was walking off the field. It was so cool that the fans were chanting, Evaldi, Evaldi, and Nate came out and, and tipped his cap. And that place, I mean, I, I think that's the loudest I've ever heard a Rangers game. And I would tell you guys that's the loud. That's one of the loudest I've ever heard a baseball game. Uh, wow. It was really, really yeah. It, I mean, still, I hate to bring it up, but I mean, it's just the reality. When Jose Bautista hit the home run in, in Game Five in 2015, that is still the loudest I've ever heard a baseball game. I mean, that was unbelievable. But some of those moments last night approached it. So, major, major props to Rangers fans because I've had people from other organizations, players, and other teams say, yeah, I mean, it was sold out, but it wasn't very loud. Or, yeah, you know, the uh, Rangers fans aren't loud or whatever. I mean, I'll just be honest. People, a lot of people said that. Wine and cheese. It's like, you know, just, just like Jerry World, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that was not the case last night. Rangers fans showed up, obviously, but Rangers fans were super, super loud. RJ, uh, Bobby Payton, what, what was it like for you guys? Because we obviously have different 
different points of uh, I don't know, points of views, not points of hearing throughout the the ballpark. To us, it was deafening. What was it like for you guys? It was. I mean, it was. It was pretty loud. There was like the, the two main um, boosts, right? The the Garcia home run, and I totally agree about the curtain call. I mean, that place went. It, it, it was like kind of like a slow build, right? Like, and then it crescendo, and then you know Nate comes out, and then I thought it was a really cool moment because you don't see, you know, it's not every day you get to see a curtain call anyway. Um, right. I, so I thought the atmosphere was pretty good. I thought also thought it was it was very, I thought from a fan perspective it was a strange game to be at because you knew the game was really decided about fifty minutes in, and yeah. now you're just as a fan you're just kind of sitting there like, all right, well. I've kind of done all the cheering, I you know, and now I've got like two hours to wait. For, we gotta now it's about like we got we gotta we gotta clean up the uh, the mess here and just finish this game off, and you know just do some house cleaning, and then the game's over. So I felt it was a little bit odd, but it was no doubt very very loud, especially in those two instances. Yeah, I, I mean it, it was incredibly loud. the The entire atmosphere. I kept trying to take videos, uh, like like I'd hold it up on a, a railing or whatever, and it, like the video just kept vibrating. I couldn't keep the phone still. So that's that's as loud as I've I've ever heard that ballpark, uh, and it's right up there with the loudest times that I ever heard the ballpark in Arlington. Love it. Uh, keep it going. Yeah. Uh, so Evaldi, since the end of the regular season, like this is a massive turnaround. Has his velocity Incre- like, has anything changed with him from from the numbers you've seen? Yeah, the velocity's up. I mean, yesterday was the he, he carried the uh, highest fastball velocity he's had throughout a start since I think it was June. Uh, so that's a great sign. I, I to me, still the the command. I mean, his so he threw strike seventy and uh, seventy seven point six or same percent of the time. Whatever the number was, it was the second highest figure since 2000 for a pitcher in a postseason game behind Andy Pettit back in 01. I think Andy Pettit had an 80% strike rate. Now, sometimes you don't want to throw that many strikes uh, because you're, you're so in the zone and, and hitters can tee off. I think that kind of speaks to his command because he wasn't just throwing pitches right over the heart of the plate. He was really, I mean, he was going corner to corner. Uh, the splitter was such a good pitch again. Uh, and I, again, I don't want to oversimplify it, but I just think the ability to, to locate that fastball on both sides of the plate, I mean, it just it makes that strike zone feel so big to a hitter. Uh, and it opens things up. And he was just nails. He didn't have a single three-ball count through six innings. <laughs> and he had two in the seventh inning. I and mean, that's it. Uh, and that's the other thing. He was getting in and out of innings pretty quickly. Uh, and, you know, this guy coming into this year had a really, really impressive postseason resume, and he's added to it. I mean, he's pitched in two closeout games. He's gotten the win in both closeout games. And in those games, he's gone 13 and two-thirds innings with 15 strikeouts and no walks. I mean, holy smokes. I, <laughs> this guy, I mean, he just – he is so good, and he has risen to the occasion. Uh, and the Rangers are going to need that because they're going to play – uh, the Twins of the Astros, and we know what's happened when the Rangers have played the Astros, and if the Twins are able to win tonight and again on Friday, uh, you know, I said it on the post-game show last night, I think a lot of Rangers fans will feel like, okay, we got the lesser of the two opponents. Hey, the Twins would be one of two teams left in the American League. You can't sleep on those guys, and they match up really well. Uh, so having this version of Nathan Avaldi back is huge. Is uh, Avaldi giving you Cliff Lee or like Mad Bum vibes? You feel like you feel like the Rangers have that guy right now when he goes out there for a postseason start, or is that is that an exaggeration? Uh, I mean, I, I I don't think it's unfair to bring it up, right? Uh, you know, Mad Bum's just a, a different level doing what he did coming out of the bullpen against the Royals in uh, was it 2014? Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, Cliff Lee. I guess the only difference I'd say, Sean, is, you know, Cliff Lee did it in Tampa in a winner-go-home game for both teams, right? So he didn't have the wiggle room of, well, if I put up a dud, then uh, we got another chance. And, uh, you know, I think that was – that that's a part of what made that so impressive. But, yeah, I mean, I guess Nathan Evaldi has, has been this team's best postseason pitcher since – Cliff Lee, I mean, you know, Kobe Lewis played for the Rangers more recently, but a lot of his best postseason work was really more during those, uh, you know, that, that first run. Uh, and then, you know, unfortunately, Cole Hamels and Hugh Darvish weren't good in the playoffs. You know, in 2016, the Rangers got swept. 
by the Blue Jays because Cole Hamels and you Darvish put up duds. So, um, yeah, I mean, Nathan Avaldi is definitely heading in that direction, no doubt about it. And then when you look at his postseason resume, he's there. Like, you know, he's only made two starts with the Rangers, but he's thrown over 50 postseason innings. He's got an ERA of 270. So, collectively, he's there. For the Rangers, he's heading there. Jared Sandler here talking with us on 105 Through the Fan. Jared, I think the most stunning figure for everybody has been the fact that in four of these five playoff games, they've allowed two runs or fewer. What is it? I mean, that was such an unpredictable thing for all of us. What's the biggest factor here, you think, in the in the pitching getting to where it is? Is it is this a boat, you think? Is this just health finally lining up at the right, right time for some of these guys? What is it that's causing pitching? Mike Maddox either. Mm-hmm. Mike Maddox as well. What What is the biggest thing, you think, that has contributed to the Rangers – finally getting some some consistent pitching here in the playoffs? Yeah, well, Bobby, it's a great question. Let me, before I answer that, just let you guys know uh, what I'm feeling right now. Let's go! <laughs> <laughs> it's just not awesome. Where's your wife? Like, great. They're going to the ALCS. Where's your wife? Like a month ago, we, we thought this team, where's she sleeping? I'm going to be in so much trouble. I know. Oh my God. Emily don't play like that, boy. Wow. Trust me. Wow. Emily no, don't play no, like no, that. Yeah. Yeah, y'all know. Sean knows for sure. Uh, so, but Cooper, when I wake her up, she's hand, definitely not happy. He, well, yeah. <laughs> hey. So, Bobby, I think a few things. One, the starting pitching has has been so good. Uh, why? Well, you know, Jordan. If you want to get into the specifics, Jordan Montgomery's change up sinker combo has been really good. We just talked about what Nathan Evaldi's done. Uh, I thought they matched up so strategically well with the Dunning Heaney combo. Uh, in game one of this series. And so like Tampa, we talked about this. They only needed to get 13 outs from the bullpen in two games. So you take your team's biggest weakness throughout the regular season. And in your first two playoff games, you sort of protect them in that regard. But the spores Chapman Leclerc combo uh, has come up big. I know Chappie wasn't great last night, but hey, let's give him credit in game one of the series. He got three outs without giving up a run in a one run game. They need a little more consistency from him. You know, there's no doubt about it. But Jose Leclerc has been nails, and Josh Spores has been nails. They really haven't had to get a whole lot out of their relievers other than those three, except for Cody Bradford, who uh, did what he did in game two. And, and I'm not counting Dane Dunning, because to me, Dane Dunning, I'm thinking of that as like a combo start with Andrew Keeney. Uh, I just think, we talked about it last night, you have the ability to be way more creative with your pitching usage in the playoffs. You can also be more aggressive. You don't have to use the seventh guy or sixth guy in your bullpen uh, if, you know, you don't feel comfortable with that guy uh, because of the off days. And let's also not forget this. The Rangers' bullpen has not had to be tested because they've swept those series, yeah. right? You know, they in Tampa, they would have had to have played a third game in a row if they would have lost one of the first two games. Here in this series, they played three games in four days. You know, that's not, that, that's not a huge uh, burden for a bullpen. And so it's opened things up for Bruce Bochy. And I just think there are, it's a little more formulaic in the regular season, the way you use a bullpen. Some teams way more formulaic than others. But you just, it, it, it's a little more predictable. In the postseason, you've got an ocean of creativity in how you want to use these guys. And when you have a manager like Bruce Bochy, who has been through this and understands how to take advantage of that opportunity to be more creative. I think it, it plays a role because some managers first time through, uh, they either stick too much to that formulaic regular season approach. Uh, They don't know how to pull that trigger creatively, or they almost put themselves in a bind because they get a little too aggressive and Bruce Bochy's pressed all the right buttons so far. Sandler, not to make excuses for Chapman last night, but how much of, you know, he's, you know, he's been historically a closer and, you know, closers seemingly when they're not in a save situation, you know, maybe a little bit off. Where's your confidence meter with him? Yeah. I mean, you, the Rangers obviously had wiggle room when he came in. Uh-huh. Uh, and so you're right. Now he pitched prior to coming to the Rangers. And even when he first came over, you know, he wasn't pitching in save situations. He was pitching in the uh, the seventh, eighth inning for the, the Royals, seventh, eighth inning for the Rangers. Uh, and I would, I would like to think that a playoff inning, no matter when, to close out a team is you know high leverage. But, yeah, he had wiggle room, and sometimes you pitch to that. Uh, my confidence level, if he has a, a day or two off, 
uh, and is coming in to start an inning, I, I feel really good about it. You know, I, I will admit, I do worry, and I'm curious if they get put in a situation, uh, what they're going to do if they feel the need to use him in back-to-back days. And so in the ALCS, the format is two games, off day, three games, off day. So, you know, during that three-game stretch, that's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, next week at home, uh, what if you get put in a spot where you got to use him in back-to-back days or those two games in Houston or Minnesota to start the series or end the series? That, that's, to me, where the question is. You would like to not uh, be concerned about using one of your best relievers in back-to-back days, uh, but, you know, that is a fair question, and they have not been in a position where they've had to t- uh, test him in that way so far. So their game one starter for Sunday it looks like who right now? I mean, I would I would imagine it's Jordan Montgomery. Uh, you know, I, I guess maybe they can make a creative decision based on uh, who they play. Minnesota struggles against lefties. They are not a very good team against lefties. So I think that'd be a no-brainer. Uh, Houston is a really good hitting team against lefties, but you know, so uh, so is Tampa Bay. So I, my guess is they go Montgomery. Uh, obviously, Avaldi there. Maybe they want to move Avaldi back to Game Three for some strategic reason. I, you know, I don't know. And I know then, you know, a follow-up question here is Scherzer and John Gray. Uh, I get the sense, especially with Max Scherzer's comments last night, that he is going to be on the ALCS roster and he plans to start now. He might not be someone who can give you six or seven innings, but, you know, any innings from Max Scherzer, I think, you know, people are going to say, let's give it a shot and see how it is. And then with John Gray, we haven't heard as much, but he'd be eligible to come off the IL uh, if there were a game five. I don't think they were going to start him in game five of this series against the Orioles, but that means he'll be ready to go or eligible for this, uh, this upcoming ALCS series. And whether it's as a starter or someone who can give you some leverage innings out of the bullpen, uh, I think John Gray is likely to be an option as well. Jared Sandler here on 105.3 The Fan, fresh out of the Rangers, champagne, beer, clubhouse celebration. Smoltz chose Mitch Garver as his ALDS MVP. Who would be yours? I mean, I guess you can't you can't knock that pick. You had seven RBIs. I, I just, I mean, let's just be honest here. It's Corey Seager. Uh you know, Corey Seager got on base, I think, like more than 100% of the time in this series, it felt like. He's, he joined, I mean, he tied a major league record, uh, reaching base three or more times now in all five games this postseason, set a record for most walks in any three game stretch uh, in, a, in a, you know, a playoff run with nine uh, and hit that home run to start things off. I, I, I think to me, it's Corey just simply because. He got on base so much, and he made it happen. But if you want to go to the two big hits, then I guess, you know, it would be Mitch, right? The grand slam. First of all, the little 40-foot dribbler uh, in the second inning of game two gave them the lead. Uh, and then his grand slam is, you know, punctuated that, that big run early on. And then yesterday, you know, they're up one nothing, and they, they intentionally walk Corey Seager, right? So you need someone behind him. You've got to get protection. And they load the bases in the second inning, and, Mitch Garver hits that shot down the line uh, to give the Rangers a 3 nothing lead. And then obviously later in the inning, Adolis, uh, uh, you know, a few pitches later does what he does. Uh, and, and that's, you know, hit these mammoth home runs and get the crowd going. So I guess you can't go wrong with Mitch. I'm not going to argue that. I just, if you really want to say like, hey, if you take this one guy away, uh, who changes the complexion the most to me, it's Corey. But Mitch did have the two biggest hits in the series, arguably. There was a chant of "We want Houston" uh, in the crowd. Do you want Houston? I want to go to the World Series and win the World Series, and I don't. I, I will not apologize if the Rangers get the lesser opponent to do that. I, I, I would love. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to lie. A part of me would love this. I mean, this. What? How amazing would it be? You know, if the Rangers could be the team that eliminates them. And I'm going to tell you something. I think the players want Houston. I, 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 again, they're not going to apologize if it's not Houston. It's not going to be a big letdown if it's not Houston. Uh, but I think they, they're ready for those guys. I think they want, they want a little revenge. Uh, and I would tell you that there are rivalries in sports that are more for the fans than the players. Um, I don't know that I – I mean, and this isn't a surprise to people, but collectively around the league, 
I don't know that there's a sports, a professional sports team in America that is maybe more disliked than the Houston Astros, like more than the Memphis Grizzlies for sure. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know what, you know, in the NFL, I don't, is there a team that really like people like hate? I mean, I don't like Us. players, like genuinely. <laughs> no, but I, but they, but they don't, right? Like, yeah, not the players. Yeah. Player. Right. Yeah. So uh, that would be electric. Now, I do think the Rangers match up better with the Twins just a little bit. I do think they have some advantages with the Astros. You know, the Astros bullpen, I think, is a little worn down. Uh, and I think the Rangers have a better rotation than the Astros. And I think that the Astros' lack of a lefty in the bullpen is something that could play a, a role uh, late innings in, in a playoff series. But let's the Astros are a better team than the Twins. So, you know, if you're looking for the – I don't want to say easier opponent, but if you're looking for maybe the better matchup, uh, then maybe the twins, you could argue that. And then the counter to that would be, well, the, all the twins do is match up. They are similar to the Rays where they, they can match up super well out of the bullpen. They can match up super well in their lineup, both to start a game and in game. And so maybe that scares you, but uh, yeah, why not? I, I'm not scared of Houston. The only thing I don't want about Houston is then I have to go spend time in Houston. And honestly, I'd rather I spent 15 hours in a holding cell in my life, and I think that was a more enjoyable experience. I'm than having sorry to go to Houston. for that. I tried to get you out earlier. <laughs> yeah. You guys, hey, you guys talked yesterday about moments that accidentally changed your life, and Bobby and RJ went like the sentimental route. Yeah, the moments that accidentally changed my life were meeting RJ Choppy and ending up in a holding cell later that evening. There's no way those two things aren't connected. <laughs> give, give, give us one, give us one more celebration. I got a need for Creed. <laughs> I got a need for Creed. I did not know where he was I, going. I was like, what? Tell your wife we apologize. Thank you for being an absolute beast, and uh, we'll catch up with you. Thank you. Love you. Let's go, fellas. 